So this is the second video of this uh, lecture 9B series, where we'll be talking about uh, disk scheduling policies, okay? So at a very high level, the fundamental question to ask given this topic is, given a stream of I/O requests, in what exact order, in what specific order should all of these queued up requests be served, right? So why we have this kind of question is because, you know, we already know that hard disk drive is extremely slow as compared to the CPU frequency, right? And uh, the presumption is um, the hard disk drive is only able to serve one and only one outstanding I/O request at a single point of time. So it's likely that while this disk device is busy servicing a one outstanding disk I/O request, um, there are already multiple disk I/O requests that arrived at the device and got queued up and waiting for the current outstanding request to be fully serviced before the next one or some order of outer scheduling could be um, <clears throat> applied so that the following one of one of the following requests could be served. Okay. So it definitely creates opportunities for performing some sort of intelligent optimizations in order to improve a specific predefined, you know, objective or goal, for example, performance improvement, bandwidth utilization, fairness, um, uh, latency variation, how to minimize latency variation, and so on and so forth, many different kinds of, you know, uh, performance and efficiency uh, metrics, okay? So, that brings us to this new topic, which is the disk scheduling. And uh, you guys must be already familiar, right, familiar with a scheduling policy. Recall that in one of the previous lectures, we've already sp spent time discussing um, scheduling in the context of uh, uh, operating system process uh, management, right? Which is the job scheduling or process scheduling. And here, we again kind of revisit the same topic, but under a, a completely different context, which is the disk IO servicing, disk IO requests, okay? So a little bit more about the background about disk schedule. First of all, we're talking about the operating system level IO request servicing. And the operating system is responsible for using the hardware efficiently. Recall that you can think of an operating system as a piece of, you know, middleware, as a piece of um, <clears throat> resource management that sits be between the upper level user programs, upper level applications, and the low level physical hardware resources. And it's mainly responsible for managing all these physical resources efficient, efficiently and arbitrating the access to the owner of resources on behalf of the end users, the user level processes, okay? And in the specific context of uh, disk, hard disk drive, this means that you wanna improve the performance by providing extremely fast, not extremely fast, but relatively fast access time. And as, at the same time, you wanna maximize the available the, the, the utilization of whatever available for in terms of the disk bandwidth, right? Recall that a disk is relatively fast. It's good at supporting large sequential IOs, which has some, something to do with the uh, high, um, the, the disk bandwidth, okay? And uh, since, and, uh, since at any time, it's likely that uh, the IO requests already arrived at the, um, the, 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 the gateway or the queue or the buffer, whatever data structure it is, whatever component it is, it has already arrived at the disk and waiting for the disk to, be, uh, to, to, to finish servicing its current request and drag another request. So it creates opportunity to apply some optimization strategy, which is to you know, effectively and intelligently reorder some of the requests that got queued up at the device to be able to, be able to effectively meet a certain predefined uh, 
objective. And uh, some example objectives include performance, for example, in terms of uh, a latency, in terms of uh, bandwidth utilization, right? For example, you could effectively um, serialize and uh, um, compact small IOs together so as to make them sequential, so as to enjoy, fully enjoy the, the bandwidth a benefit provided by a typical hard disk drive. Okay, so this is performance. And uh, another objective is fairness. So <clears throat> since a disk device is commonly shared by multiple processes, but multiple users, so a single disk queue, it might contain like requests from multiple end users from multiple jobs. You don't want to starve a certain request that belongs to a certain user. That means you want to guarantee fairness. Okay, so this is the second objective. And the third object is, objective is to provide consistent latency. So what, what does it mean? Well, so it's uh, sometimes the latency is highly variable. And this is a bad sign for the end user because you basically don't get predictable performance. But it's desirable to have predictable performance. So that is why another objective of hard disk drive is to be able to provide effectively consistent and predictable latency. So this often has something to do with the uh, uh, kind of you know service level agreement or service level objective. If we're talking about um, cloud computing in the context of public clouds, right? So this is kind of you know similar consistency, consistent latencies, okay? And uh, typically the disk scheduling component is implemented within both operating system as well as the uh, uh, hardware, uh, the, the disk, the disk device itself internally, okay? So as we've al already mentioned in the previous slide, uh, the disk scheduling has is strictly tied to the performance objective, right? And recall that in our previous lecture, uh, we've kind of touched this topic already, which is the performance modeling in the context of hard disk drive, right? And uh, um, a disk IO latency typically consists of three factors. And the first factors correspond with the, the moving mechanical parts, basically the the disk arm. The disk arm needs to like move back and forth, right? In order to uh, identify and locate a specific disk track. And at the same time, the platter underneath is rotating like constantly. And at the same time, you try to seek and you try to identify the particular sector the logical block of request, and then read the data out from the logical block or write some data into it. And this is often called a block device because the fundamental IO granularity is a particular sector or a logical disk block, the size of which might be half a kilobyte or a more common case, four KB, four kilobytes, okay? so. Um, let's do a brief review over here. Let's assume this is a disk platter. Okay. In the center, we have a spindle. And on top of the platter, it has multiple disk tracks. Let's assume this platter, it has only two tracks. Okay. So this is outermost track. Track zero. And inside of it, we have Track one. And we have a disk arm over here, right? So this is a disk arm. On the other end of the disk arm, we have a disk head. Okay. So this disk arm <coughs> moving back and forth so that it can locate one of the tracks on the platter on the surface of the disk. And at the same time, let's assume this disk is rotating. This platter is rotating counterclockwise, okay?
And uh, the presumption of this rotation uh, direction is that a disc platter could only rotate with a single, with a certain direction. It rotate either counterclockwise or clockwise. It cannot rotate like uh, between these two different, uh, using these two different uh, directions back and forth. And this is not possible. So this is, this is a presumption of the disc rotation operations. Okay, so it's the combination of both of these two different activities, the seeking operations, okay, together with the rotating operated operations that kind of <clears throat> facilitate the, uh, the whole uh, disk IO servicing operation, okay? And the major performance objective, since this first two mechanical moving parts uh, namely seeking operation and rotating activity. These two are the dominating factor that determines the latency for a disk IO. If we're talking about like not too large IOs where the, the transfer factor dominates, we're talking about like relatively small IOs, then these first two factors, they are dominating. So the whole latency is kind of dictated by these two mechanical moving parts, okay? so. One typical performance objective is to, you know, to, to intelligently do something to be able to effectively minimize the distance the hat needs to move, the hat needs to like seek, and uh, uh, at the same time, the, um, uh, the platter is rotating and the rotation distance should also be minimized as well, okay? So here, uh, let's take a look at another performance metric, which is the disk, uh, disk bandwidth. And again, recall that in our previous lecture, we've already talked about uh, this disk bandwidth. And one of the, <clears throat> if you buy, if you purchase a hard disk drive, it's listed as one of the performance metrics. For example, 100, uh, 100 plus megabytes per second or some high-end disk device. It could be able to reach uh, 600 megabytes per second, and this is extremely fast. So, so, so this is this is this bandwidth. But how to understand what does it mean? Well, it's defined as the total number of bytes that get transferred uh, during a unit time. Okay, divided by the total time between the first request for services and the completion of the last request transfer. Okay, so basically the total amount of bytes that could be transferred uh, within the time unit. And the time unit could be a second typically or a minute, okay? But a minute is like unpractically large. So often we're talking about like per, uh, per second uh, amount of data transfer. So this is the disk bandwidth metric, okay? So keep that in mind. And we'll be talking about that in the next couple of slides. <coughs> All right. So, as I've already kind of mentioned, there are many sources of uh, disk IO requests. So, the operating system is used to provide the uh, resource management functionality to the upper level applications, to the user programs. So, the user programs, the user processes, are a major source of the disk IO requests. But it doesn't mean that operating system doesn't need to access the file system, access the data stored on a hard disk drive or a secondary storage device. So operating system, as well as some system level processes, they are also the source of uh, generating, that generates the disk IO requests. So these are all the different sources, which is kind of easy to understand, right? Okay, so typically, and our request is, uh, can be divided into these two different parts, read operations, read request, and write request. And our request typically consists of uh, the following information. For example, it consists of a disk address, right? Where the data is located or where you want the data to be stored at. And also the memory address, right? So this is where the, um, if you want to read something out from disk, and store it within the memory. So this is a target memory address. Okay, so we have memory address. And we also have, you know, the amount of data transfer. So this is typically defined 
as one or multiple sectors to be transferred during the IO request. The size of the data in terms of the number of sectors, okay? And these three high-level information are enough for constructing a particular IO request. <clears throat> and at the operating system level, within the device driver system software, it maintains its own software-defined queue, software-implemented queue of outstanding IO requests that get queued up, that haven't been serviced by the underlying physical hardware, which is hard disk drive, okay? And often, per disk or per device, it maintains a single queue within the context of operating system, okay? And uh, <clears throat> the, the idle disk can just immediately work on the one of the outstanding I requests. But the busy disk means the work must queue because presumably the disk is only able to service one and only one request at a time. Because hard disk drive doesn't have this uh, you know, parallelism. It's not able to service requests concurrently or in parallel. And this is one of the major difference between hard disk drive and a flash SSD device. And in the next lecture, we'll be talking about the internal working market zones of a flash device, which is able to improve the performance. And a part of the reason is because SSD device, flash SSD is able to service requests in parallel, okay, at a single time, okay? So since disk is slow and it's not able to parallelize requests, Optimizations, uh, scheduling optimizations make sense in this context because there's a queue and you could perform scheduling optimizations on top of the items uh, queued up within this queue, okay? It only makes sense when the queue exists, all right? So it's not only um, the queue does exist within the operating system, so within the, the drive, the hard disk itself, it has a little tiny buffer, which, which is the, the depth of which is often an important configuration parameter that directly affects the performance of a hard disk drive, okay? <clears throat> this is kind of out of the scope, but it's not, it doesn't hurt um, to learn about it, okay? Um, then, um, we'll be talking about a various classic uh, disk scheduling policies or algorithms. So disk scheduling algorithm, just kind of similar to the, uh, the job, CPU job scheduling algorithms, it's the policies that decide and schedule the orders of outstanding queued up uh, disk I requests, okay? So this is disk scheduling algorithms. Um, and of course, the assumption that, so, so here, next uh, we're gonna do some a simple analysis and to basically illustrate the different disk scheduling algorithms that belongs to this disk scheduling policy family. And this analysis is true for either one platter or multiple platters. So here we just assume we're talking about a single platter, right? We call that, we have the 3D dimensional, the 3D graph illustration about the internal mechanism of hard disk drive, right? It has multiple platters. And we have a disk arm assembly. And the disk arm assembly is where the disk arm is attached with. Okay. Arm. Platter. Within the center, we have a spindle, and it's uh, it's rotating. Let's assume counterclockwise. And here we assume that analysis is true. It applies to both one or multiple pl platters. Okay, so, and we use this single simplified toy-like example workloads to illustrate 
the various different classic disk I.O. scheduling policies. And here we look at a screen of integers where each integer, so, so here we, you can kind of think of this uh, screen of integers as a outstanding request I.O. request queue, okay? It's an example I request queue. And each and every integer within this queue, within this workload, is a disk address. But how understand this disk address? Because you can only lo locate, you can only identify a particular sector because a particular sector belongs to both a certain track and also within the track it has a sector number it's a track number and a sector number okay so you need to you need this two-dimensional information it's a 2d information you need this two-dimensional information to be to be able to identify and i uh, locate a specific sector id right so here we understand this particular number as the cylinder id or the track id and we kind of release the, um, we don't assume the sector. And the sector is implicitly, the sector information is implicitly embedded, which is not explicitly handled uh, by this workload, okay? So that means, and each and every number within this um, workload is corresponding with a specific sector. That also means, that here we kind of more focus on the disk arm movement kind of operations, okay? So here this, here this is the 2D graph of a disk platter, and we have multiple sectors, we have multiple tracks, right? And we have a disk arm over here. And the disk arm is able to rotate. Oh, sorry, the disk arm is able to like, seek back and forth, right? Okay, in order to locate uh, a specific track. So here, the number, different number belongs to different tracks, okay? All right, so initially the header, the hat pointer pointing to the track ID, which is uh, 53. Okay. So the very first classic um, disk scaling policies that we're going to introduce is FIFO, first in, first out. And remember, we've already talked about this before, but in a different context, where we discussed the CPU job scheduling policies. We've talked about the FIFO policies as well, right? So it works exactly the same as the uh, the disk, uh, the the job scheduling policy, where it specifies under a FIFO policy, the operating system, the the the, the disk device serves the I/O requests just following the exact order that they arrive at the device. Okay, so this is FIFO, which is straightforward and simple to understand. Okay, so here it shows the the workload. And this two-dimensional graph. So how to understand this two-dimensional graph is this x dimension. This x dimension is obviously the tractor dimension. Okay, so this is tractor. Tractor. The track, sorry. The track dimension, okay. So kind of, you know, the the uh, the track is organized in a way, like the circular way, on the platter, right? So let's assume this is a platter. So assume the inner track we call it track ID zero, one, two, three, four, dot dot dot, and we have the maximum. Let's assume it's. 199, assuming it has a total number of 200 different tracks. And over here, this 
any single integer within this workflow, let's say 67, 65, these two are relatively close tracks somewhere over here, okay? And this is the first dimension, this is x dimension. And note here, we have a y dimension. So what is this y dimension? Well, you can kind of understand it as a time dimension, timeline, but strictly speaking, this is not, because the, the platter has two dimensions. The first dimension is a track dimension, and the second dimension is a sector, right? So within each track, it's organized in terms of multiple sequential sectors. So within a single track. So let's assume we are flattened this track. We flatten this track, okay? So let's say this track is number one. Track number one consists of multiple sectors. Okay, so this is one sector. Sector N. This is sector Z, okay? Random sectors. So I would say the Y dimension, it's a sector ID dimension. Sectors. And because how to how to basically uh, move the the disk arm and disk hat to be able to have it target a specific sector is because of the uh, the platter rotation operation. And assuming this example, the platter is rotating counterclockwise. So this is rotation. And assume that it could only rotate with a single direction, not the opposite direction, okay? So that means with this Y dimension, it could only develop downwards. It cannot move in back. This is not allowed, right? Because we, we could only have one single rotation direction, okay? So that means that this sector numbers either increase monotonically or de decrease monotonic depends on the exact rotation uh, direction. Okay, so with that in mind, let's take a look at this workload. Okay, so here this workload we're talking about FIFO, right? So FIFO it just serves the request with the order that they've arrived at the uh, the device. So given that, assume, assume. Initially, the pointer is settled at track track um, um, 53. So that is why over here, it starts from track 53. So this is a star starting point, okay? And then follow the, the time order, the time timestamp order where the request arrived at the queue, and the first one is 90, 98, and followed by the second one, which is 183. 183 is over here. And then third one is 37. 37 is over here. And this is another, you know, track on the opposite direction. You have to move your disk arm. Okay, so this essentially captures the disk arm movement and assume we have a disk arm over here. And the disk arm is rotating. Okay. And try to identify and locate a specific um, track number of request. I guess hopefully this is clear enough to you guys, okay? And then just follow the, uh, the specific order of the request of the, uh, the workload and until it finishes the last point, which is 67. And of, over here, 64, 67, they are close enough, okay? Which is typically a good thing, which is the desirable thing that, that the disk hard disk drive desires. Because you don't need to move the disk arm um, with a long distance, okay? So, a typical, so under this kind of scenario, the question is, so how do you calculate the total amount of, the total distance of a, a disk? So disk uh, R movements, namely the total number of cylinders, the total number of tracks 
that has been scanned by the disk arm, this piece of hardware, right? So how to calculate this in the context of FIFO algorithms is, so over here, we do, so you first calculate, so it's actually, it's a zigzag, right? Zigzag. It's following these extremely bad pattern. So how to calculate is the total amount of uh, um, distance, the total number of cylinders that it travels is just, we, 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 we calculate the segment length and we sum them up together, okay? So 183 minus 53 plus um, 183 minus 37 plus one, um, so this is 122 minus 33 and plus 122 minus 14 plus 124 minus 14 and uh, plus the next one is 65 minus uh, So the next is um, 124 minus 65. And the last one is 67 minus 65. You sum all these up together, which gives you um, 640. So it basically travel this total amount of cylinders, 640 cylinders, okay? Which is also listed over here. <clears throat> so this this is a same again this is a simplified assumption where we don't we don't kind of capture this rotation distance the platter rotation distance but in practice this rotation distance is also kind of affected by the a specific uh, disk scheduling policies but over here we kind of uh, um, ignore the rotation distance over here, okay? We only care about the total amount of cylinders traveled. We only care about um, the only cares about the disk arm seeking distance. So this is assumption that you need to keep in mind in order to simplify this whole problem. All right, so the next um, policy is called SPTF, which is a short of shortest position time first. So the idea is also straightforward. You just select the request that will take the least amount of time for seeking and rotating. And we put it into this presences because it's kind of out of scope. We don't assume rotation distance. So we only care about the seeking distance over here, okay? It's also called shortest seek time first, SSTF, if the rotational positioning is not considered. And this rotational position is not considered is the, the common assumption, okay? All right, so let's take a look at how it works uh, within this simple example. And again, the hat starts from the cylinder or the track ID of 53. And because it kind of works as a greedy algorithm, it's kind of like the shortest job first, remember? Shortest job first, where you only serve the next shortest job. In this case, you translate the shortest job in the form that fits in this uh, disk arm rotating, this disk arm seeking process, which is you always serve the next request that is the most closest to you, that takes the least time for seeking, okay? <clears throat> so obviously the next one, which is close to 53, which is starting point is 65, right? And then followed by the next closed, closest neighbor 
and followed by the next closest neighbor, which is closest to 67. Obviously, it's um, 37, and followed by 14. And then the next one, there's no close by neighbors, close by requests. You look back and see for the rest of the requests, which one of them is the closest, which takes the least amount of time for seeking, for moving this disk arm piece of hardware. It turns out it's a 98. And then you go all the way to the rightmost and until you reach the last point, which is 183. And in the context of this greedy algorithm, the greedy policy, which is shortest positioning time first, obviously it reorders each and every request within this queue, right? It performs a totally reordering of all the requests in this example. <clears throat> and it has a benefit. The benefit is because it reorders everything, it kind of translate random access into um, sequential access, <clears throat> which is well suited or disks. Okay, so this is the uh, motivation, the or the intuition behind the shortest position position of time for algorithm. <clears throat> In order to calculate the total amount of cylinders or tracks that are covered within this process, you do the math, right? So first of all, sixty-seven minus fifty-three. This is the first segment and plus the second segment which is 67 minus <clears throat> 14 which covers the second piece of set and then the rest of the calculation the third step is trivial you just cover the rest as a single piece right so from the rightmost which is 183 minus the leftmost which is 14 you do the math, that gives you a total number of two, 236 total number of cylinders. And if you compare this value with the previous value, which is 640, and obviously this greedy kind of algorithm is a huge win, it's a big win, right? Because it's able to cut short the total amount of uh, seeking distance by more than two times. It's almost three times, right? Improvement, okay, which is a good thing. And more importantly, it's able to effectively translate the random IOs into sequential IOs, okay? And recall that a hardest drive is pretty good at sustaining sequential large IOs, and it's really bad. It sucks in supporting random IOs. And those out of core algorithms, for example, out of core quick sort, it sucks. Its performance really sucks in the context of a hardest drive. Okay, so this is it. And the next um, policy is called scan. You can also call it activator algorithm. So why it's called activator algorithm is you have this disk arm sweep back and forth, okay? And as it go with one direction, you serve request on the go, as you go, okay? So how to better understand this is by looking at the following text. The disk arm, it starts at one end of the disk. How to understand this? One end of the disk, you can understand it. The, let's say it starts from the innermost, the spindle part, or from the outermost track. Again, I like to draw on this. So we have innermost and we have and we have innermost. And either from outermost or from innermost between these two, 
as it goes, it serves the cylinders as it, as you go, okay? So this is also called scanner uh, elevator algorithm. Okay, so here it shows how it performs given the specific workload. Let's assume this scan algorithm at first scan towards the left end, okay? It first scan towards the smaller track IDs. In this case, starting from 53, it just go by one direction, which is the leftmost direction, okay? So that means it first assume sector zero is the innermost, and we have outermost. It always starts from somewhere, and it tries to go inside, and then sweep back outside, towards the outside direction. Okay, so this is how to better understand this. So it sweep with leftmost, towards the leftmost, and then sweep back towards the rightmost. Okay, as it sweep on the way, it serves to request, request as the disk arm goes. Okay, and over here, if you calculate total amount of sectors, total amount, uh, sorry, the total amount of cylinders that gets covered, you use 53 minus zero plus the next. So this is the first segment. And the next segment is uh, this part, which is a 183 minus zero. Okay, so this gives you 236, which is exactly the same as a previous example, okay? So this is the scan algorithm, also called elevator kind of resemble how elevator behaves in real world examples, okay? And the next one is called C-Scan, which is a simple extension on top of the baseline scan algorithm, which is called circular scan. Idea is similar against uh, with the previous one. The only difference is that instead of sweeping between these two, uh, both between, uh, both uh, two directions, it only sweep within one direction. So this is the most important assumption, implication, okay? So as long as it reaches the other end, it circle back, it sweep, it move back without serving any request, right? And then um, starting with the predefined single direction again, okay? So the, 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 the impact or the fact that it brings to the performance is it kind of pro provides a more uniform wait time than a scan because for a scan, the, the request on either end, either the leftmost end or the rightmost, rightmost end, they, took, they kind of starve because the requests that are clustered in the middle tends to be serviced like the fastest. Okay, because you need to travel all the way from the leftmost to the rightmost in order to serve the request clustered spread towards one extreme. If you have just too many requests in the middle, you kind of starve the request on the other extreme and a little, a little bit. But that doesn't mean like starvation forever. It just starve for, um, it impacts the fairness a little bit. Okay. So in order to solve, provide better fairness, we introduce this uh, single circular scan op operation and it tends to provide a more uniform wait, wait time as compared to scan. Okay, so how it works is over here, let's assume, is for this particular C scan, it can only scan towards the right. Okay, if you take a look at this direct, uh, this example, starting from 56, it can only scan towards the, the right. And then 
circle back without servicing any request. I use this dashed line to represent circle back without serving. And then go ahead, scan towards the right, serving requests. So in this case, the total number of cylinders, how to calculate that is 199 minus 53 plus 199 minus zero, which is the middle part, which is the circle back part, plus 37 minus zero. So that gives you how much? That gives you a total number of 382, right? Okay, so the next one is called C loop, which is circular look. Okay, the idea is sim similar to C scan, but instead, the only minor difference is the arm only goes as far as the last request in this direction without hitting the boundary. So note here, the C scan it always hit the boundary, even though the boundary 199 doesn't have a request really, if you still hit the boundary and bounce back. And over here, the leftmost, you bounce back towards the leftmost boundary, which is zero, even though zero is not a request, right? But C look is different as this. It stops at the last request, the last meaningful request, okay? And then reverse direction immediately. So a look is a version of scan because scan always touch, you know, the boundary and bounce back. And C look is a variant of C scan, a variant of circular scan, but it doesn't bounce back. It stops at the very last request and then directly circle back. But let's take a look at how it works. Again, assume that it sweep only towards the right direction, only right direction. Okay. And over here, starting from 53. And then the last request on the rightmost is 183. You stop over here instead of bouncing back from the boundary, and then you directly circle back. I should use the dash line because you, you never serve a request as it go back. And then start, stop, stop from 14 because 14 is the one request that is close to the left boundary, but left boundary doesn't obviously have a request. So it stops over there and serve 14. And then move on to the last one, which is 37. Okay, the total number of cylinders, how to calculate is 183 minus 53 plus 183 minus the middle part, the, the circle back part, 14 plus 37 minus 14. Do the math, gives you a total number of 322. Okay, this is C look. All right, so that kind of completes the disk scheduling policy family. So here next, we introduce some more practical uh, issues, implications. So here we specifically talk about this term, which is called work conservation. So work conserving scheduler. Always try to do IO if there's IO to be done, okay? And sometimes it's better to, you know, delay a little bit, wait a little bit. Instead, if you anticipate, another request will appear nearby and hopefully that request will appear. So instead of like circle back all the way back from the rightmost to the leftmost, if there's a request hitting in, like within the spatial parameter is nearby parameter, you just go ahead and serve that request instead of moving all the way back to the other end. So this, by introducing a little bit this work conservation, by introducing a little bit this uh, so-called procrastination, right? Delay a little bit. It tends to work better because IO, IO workload always have this kind of you know spatial temp, spatial locality property, and this is really good for preserving spatial locality property. Okay.
And uh, in real world cases, and the Linux operating system, by default, it uses a disk scheduling algorithm, which is called completely fair queuing or a short CFQ. Okay? So instead of maintaining a single software queue, it maintains multiple queues, and each process has its own queue. Okay? And then you do some fancy, more complicated, comprehensive scheduling policies. For example, you do weighted round robbing among different queues in order to provide proportional sharing while maintaining performance as well as fairness. And uh, the optimal orders within a queue, so that within a particular queue, you can do this reorder, kind of like the shortest positioning the time first algorithm, which is a greedy algorithm that, that do this totally reordering of op operations in order to optimize for latency and uh, to improve the utilization for the disk bandwidth resource. Okay, so this is a real world example, which is kind of out of the scope. So, but it no hurts if you know more about it. Okay. All right, so the last piece of slide as a summary how to decide to select a specific disk scheduling algorithm. So this requires obviously knowledge about each and every individual scheduling policies. So for example, the first one, the greedy policy, shortest positioning first, time first, is common and it has a, um, it is good at servicing all the, uh, the, the requests that clustered in the middle part of the, the tracks, but it has a, an issue because the, um, the request that's spread across, that's scattered from um, the, the, the leftmost and the rightmost extreme points, they tend to get starved. So that impacts the fairness a little bit. Fairness gets impacted a little bit. Okay, and C scan and skin and performs better for a system that plays a heavy load on the disk. And it, 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 it introduces less starvation. Okay. And uh, the obviously the performance it kind of depend depending on the specific workload characteristic. For example, the total number of requests and the different types of requests. And the disk scheduling algorithm should be written as a separate operating system module so that it creates flexibility. So when you need a different policy, you can directly do this hot plugin, okay, to be replaced with the different algorithms if necessary in order to flexibly serve like a diversified uh, workload patterns, okay?